Welcome everyone for joining us for today's presentation, uh, achieving high availability and disaster recovery across multiple data centers with a single Oracle architecture. In today's presentation, um, we're going to demonstrate a solution that we use in a real world uh, use case uh, to meet uh, business requirements and high availability and some disaster recovery. Uh, one of the key factors in designing uh, an extended rack environment is the data center infrastructure. And so on this presentation with me today is Bryce, uh, Bryson Hopkins. He's going to be discussing some of the characteristics of their data centers that contributed to our extended rack design uh, being successful. Uh, Bryson is with Equinix and leads the team of global solution architects who provide the strategic consulting and the advisory services to current prospective clients. Uh, he and his team is, recommends the strategies and solutions to help customers address the technology challenges uh, and, and to include how to bridge the network, the data center, any cloud and IT infrastructure to accelerate business performance. And with that, Bryson. Hi, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on with you today. Um, just to set the stage on what I want to talk about from Equinix One, I just want to give everybody a brief overview of, of who we are and, and what our space in the market is. I know when we talk data centers, there's varying level of service providers that give different services to end customers. I'm going to explain Equinix. And then I want to explain how Equinix can be the solid foundation to help build highly available solutions. And as you go through this webinar and the takeaways that I want you to, to glean from this is, understand what your data center provides today and how it can impact and or accelerate the performance and the growth of your applications, especially as we talk about layering things, you know, the network to servers and services to application architecture. Um, the, the data center is becoming a critical component of how people um, view and build applications today. Uh, but just briefly, Equinix, we are a worldwide company. We're one of the largest world, world, worldwide retail co-location providers. We're in 31 markets across the world. Um, our map of the United States extends from most of the major cities up and down the East Coast and, uh, and Central um, the US as well. Um, we're about a $2 billion company and we we reinvest heavily every year in building data centers. That is our core competency. Our core competency is the running data center operations uh, in, to be best in class in the world. So space, power, cross connects, keeping the facility and infrastructure up and running. Platform Equinix is, you know, is, is the marketing branding term of how we, we define our value proposition to the market. So first is we provide you know, bulletproof, stable data center operations environment. We, we almost every year exceed our SLAs for keeping power and environmentals safe and secure for customers. We operate that consistently with, on a global scale, which is a great benefit to many of our customers that, that do use us in multiple regions and multiple metros throughout the world. We also are, uh, if you, the, the history of Equinex is an interconnection company. Um, we help facilitate the, the interconnection between networks around the world. So when two carriers have to exchange traffic and information, they usually do it in Equinex, which is a, you know, our, our term is a vendor neutral co-location facility. And back in the 90s when Equinex was founded, the internet was running into the scaling problem and Equinex allowed the networks to scale at size by being that neutral point where they would interconnect with one another. And now as we've moved into new areas, cloud, financial services, enterprises, we offer that same benefit of being able to directly interconnect to your service providers, partners, cloud technology uh, providers, and networks to have, you know, essentially that, that, that connect is a piece of fiber over which you run as much data as you want. We don't charge for networks. We don't run networks. So it opens up the opportunities, and I'll talk about that later, about how you can build high-performance solutions uh, in our data centers. Again, I mentioned this uh, about a minute ago, a brief snapshot of, of where we are. Um, again, we're, we are unique in the market that we are a, a, a global platform. We just provide the data centers. You can see that we're heavily focused in the key markets in the United States. We have new data centers that came online in Brazil. We're one of the first companies to have a 
an international uh, presence inside of Dubai as well as Shanghai. It's a it's a big boon for American companies that need to do business in those regions due to certain trade and uh, import export um, limitations. And we also have a, a, a solid uh, deployment in, inside throughout all of Europe, um, London, you know, Amsterdam, Frankfurt. Those are major financial and inter networking connection points for all of Europe. Uh, if you were to lay down fiber topology maps, you would see that a lot of fiber runs through um, our core centers throughout the you know the East Coast, West Coast, United States, and Europe. We, you know, I mentioned interconnection a, a moment ago. Uh, one of the things that you know and anybody can can test out is you know if you're starting to interconnect between uh, multiple networks and multiple carriers, what you'll find is that we have a um, a preponderance of uh, traffic coming through our center. So if you're on the East Coast and you know you run trace routes, then you're going to see an IAD symbol pop up in your you know trace route um, response that's coming through our data centers. It, because Equinix is built as the main interconnecting point for carriers, we have a lot of capacity of fiber and you know physical infrastructure running through our campuses. And that that means that when anybody has to move and build out and grow, they just grow it organically in, in, in our current footprint. You know, over 900 network providers call Equinix home. They use it to, again, route core backbone services and also distribute services out to the major regional metros throughout the United States. So we have, you know, the, all the large tier one providers, you know, Sprint, Network, um, Sprint, Verizon, AT&T, a lot of the tier twos, tier three, and even smaller regional providers from the United States, you know, Europe and Asia will use us to interconnect and long haul traffic back and forth across the world. Cloud companies, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Azure, Google, all understand that the key to a high performant, highly adopted user experience is the best network uh, and user response between their cloud services that they're consuming and you know, their endpoints, whether they be internal endpoints or you know the user constituency they're supporting. Uh, we have a saying uh, that's kind of developed around Equinix is that you can either bring the internet to your data or, or the data to your or to the internet. So a lot of companies, yes, Netflix is all in the cloud, but they use Equinix data centers to help distribute their content. Amazon builds hyperscale data centers, but then they connect their networks directly into Equinix data centers to then connect into the providers. They understand that they need to be at the apex of internet routing and internet you know, packet traffic and, and interconnection. So we, we provide that advantage for them. Uh, you know, Amazon has, is, is famous for having very low tolerances for um, checking out you know, on, the, on your Amazon shopping cart and a lot of that functionality happens you know, in our facilities because it's a, they need to have that instant user response and they can't and they can't tolerate the latency of long hauling traffic back and forth between potentially any user or any customer and then you know, their services so they're moving applications and providing and their services as close as possible and we see that as a broad market trend across the industry so Equinix as we were the home of networking and interconnection is now becoming a key strategic point for a lot of cloud and SaaS providers. So the last couple slides just gave you a little bit of overview of where we're at and where we're positioned in the market. Uh, again, I just want to focus on that. You know, we, we're just a data center company, yes, but the, the power of Platform Equinix from an interconnection standpoint, being able to help build and design new applications, improve user experience, that's some of the, the, the knowledge and the abilities that, you know, people like myself and my team and then, you know, our people in our company bring. So we provide that bulletproof operations, but then we also bring how industry and the larger market trends, you know, in, enable new application services to be deployed. You know, through our through our global network footprint, you know, it's you know, we don't you don't need to have large deployments with us. You know, if if you're a smaller company or you need, you know, something just deployed in you know one or two cabinets in South America, that's fine. That's one of the values of uh, that we bring to the table is deploying a cabinet with us out of country, out of region is just as simple as deploying something in Chicago or Dallas. 
So we provide that that ease of business and of flexibility and adaptability to give you what you need when you need it. Um, I talked a little bit about the financial. So when we talk about ecosystems in, in, in Equinix, what we're referring to is you know, a, a, a constituency of partners that are either buying or selling services from one another. Um, a lot of the enterprise customers come to Equinix because of accessibility to cloud like Amazon through Direct Connect, like Azure through our direct and express services, but then also getting to network providers. Additionally, if they're in a revenue generating mode or service, then they're able to reach a much broader audience potentially faster by deploying in our centers. And again, really, we design and operate where we think the best data centers on the planet and people like myself you know, and our sales force are here to help you know, people such as yourselves or other customers or people think through how to, how to deploy and take advantage of interconnectivity, network reach, high capacity utilizations, uh, cloud service providers to design and architect next generation solutions. One of the things I find you know most interesting as I as as we talk is you know I, I've come from the enterprise, um, and we're now considering the data centers as part of our a, a key decision point in the design development of applications. A lot of times, you know, in the enterprise, we spend a lot of time overcoming poor data center design and placement by doing things like you know having to do way acceleration or making design and architecture trade offs for replication or DR or other kinds of uh, performance characteristics around our app. Well now, because of the um, kind of explosion of the data center market uh, in the last five to seven years, there's now options. So you don't, you're not always stuck in the carrier hotel or the carrier provided colo space or potentially the space you know, inside the enterprise walls. You know, intelligently use the right asset, mean the right data center asset for the right application. And we're seeing more people, more companies, you know, broaden out to determine and take advantage of, you know, third party co-locations such as Equinix. You know, if you look at a company like Box, uh, we were able to help them in that same kind of um, mode of, so yes, they have two large data centers they use to serve their, their main storage uh, services and product lines, but then they, ex they logically and physically extended part of their networking capabilities throughout our data center footprint. So they moved their services closer to us, so they were able to consume what they needed, deploy where they needed to to get close to high customer densities, and then able to take that traffic back. So we helped improve a lot of the uh, aspects of the performance of their service by simply helping them deploy a few things. We're not talking large, you know, a couple cabinets is, is all we're talking about with these kind of deployments, so it's not a, you know, five megawatt or 600 cabinet type of deployment. I mentioned earlier in, in the in the kickoff slides how much we how much energy we put into constantly evolving and investing in new designs and build outs. Um, you know, this is a it's it's a interesting snapshot. That's kind of some of our um, you know our, our our hallmark colors. You know, the the yellow is our fiber trays, and we have blue steel for our uh, facilities. Um, but we you know we take a lot of um, design diligence in making sure that we design the most efficient use of space for power and cooling, but then also um, ease of use for customers. Things like overhead tray, you know, cable trays, ladder racking, you know, fire suppression systems. Um, we're we're heavily in you know in the United States at least we build everything you know on concrete slab, and you know, we do uh, our typical deployments are hot out, cold out containment. Again, we're we're trying to design centers that are the most flexible and adaptable to you know, any potential customer employment, you know, on one hand, you could have somebody in a cage that has, you know, five servers uh, or five racks running servers and the other guy, you know, in the cage next to him could be running, you know, 10 racks of high, highly dense, high performance blade server, solid state computing. So we've designed our environments to be able to satisfy the needs of both equally. Security is one of the big uh, boons by coming into Equinix, we have five levels of biometric uh, access to get from you know what, what, what we call the curb to the cabinet. So there's no, there's no way somebody's going to be able to just run straight into our facilities. Um, we we keep the facilities monitored with 24 by 7 guards. You know you, you know at, at least two plus one patrolling cameras throughout our facilities. So 
and we provide you know, customers the ability to access some of those records so they can also see who's coming in and out and they have the ability to find finally uh, control who can and will have access not only to the building but then also to an individual cage and also almost sometimes down to the exact rack um, you know when somebody opens you know your cage door you know part of the, the systems that we provide that you know that that not only is captured from the biometric you know, door opening perspective, but it's also caught you know on camera as well. So it's it's very difficult to get in and out of an Equinox facility completely unnoticed. I would say one of the one of the more emerging conversations that we have now with customers is our ability to deliver a variety of power and scale power as the needs of the compute environment changes. You know, if you think about the evolution and density in blade servers, the, the density of storage services that are these you know, switches, optical networking, um, the, the power draw on the data center now is, is, is starting to complete, it's starting to really accelerate. And that's where Equinix, I think, really helps out a lot of people because we can provide that power day one and then also make changes along the way. There's never a capacity issue, you know, at uh, you know at an Equinix IBX. You know, we're we're able to design power feeds to customer cages, whether it's you know one cabinet of you know low power with moderate power throughout, or whether it's gonna, or whether we design multiple high power density uh, deployments, you know, 13 kilowatts and up. I mean, that's our job to keep ahead of the power curve. So this was a little bit about um, you know the the products we provide and our um, you know kind of our strengths again you know we're a co-location company you know, we provide you know a range of options around you know cages um, and, and cabinets that you're able to to purchase or rent from us um, we interconnect you to the partners that you need or the partners that you want to do business with and we do that through a couple different um, uh, products that we have today one is it's a physical fiber and I'll talk about that and then. The peering points is where carriers come together to exchange routes and traffic, and then we have, um, you know, within the data centers itself, you know, places for uh, if you're doing large deployments, if you're going to have you know a temporary office facility while you do a major transitional migration, we also provide the ability for having support staff there, you know, on site in comfortable work environments. So that I hope gives you. Uh, just a, a brief, but kind of more of a kind of a little bit of a holistic overview of Equinix. But what I want to focus on is if having the ability to deploy a solution that meets all of your objectives around latency, application response time, uh, or certain other application tolerance limits. If you could do that, and I'm going to show you how with Equinix you're able to do that with one provider one data center company and how we can start building the solution by you know getting the base level done you know first with Equinix and then moving up the stack through the networking providers that are in our facility and then ultimately we're going to talk about how your know, new bear provides their solution on top of that to provide a, a highly available solution so just as like a quick checklist when we talk highly available survivable services these are the things that we make recommendations for customers if it's truly mission critical, can never go down. Definitely consider multi-rack, multi-cage deployments. Um, racks obviously can be separated within the same cage, but you can also have multiple cages within Equinix. The great part is that those cages are connected over direct fiber cross connects. So it looks like a completely you know, flat network from a networking perspective. So there's no routing or there's no network provider. Equinix isn't in the way. Again, it's a piece of fiber between point A and point B bring in redundant power to each one of your cabinets. When you do that, Equinix provides 100% SLAs on power distribution to that rack and to that service. Um, we take care of the redundancy on the backside. You're routing things through multiple patch panels, PDUs, even down to the generators and the facilities that provide power into the data center itself. Um, running multiple fiber interconnects between cages, whether it's your own cage that you're connecting to a service provider or a network run to 100% SLA and it's never going to go down. And with, um, I've talked about the network providers and the densities we have at our at our uh, key data centers throughout the world. You know, each one 
you know, in Ashburn, where, where I'm headquartered, we have over 300 different network carriers that call net, that call Equinix home. So that does two things for you. One, it provides you the ability to, you know, a, uh, to a procure a range of network services, whether they're less than T1 or all the way up to, you know, 100 gig or dark fiber. But you're also going to have and experience the, the lowest price points because of the economics of the competition on the campus. You're, you're also able to get not only primary internet connectivity, but you're also able to get backup connectivity at a much lower rate. So you can always have a you know primary internet route plus backup routes in case you need it and you're not breaking the bank running you know, a complete you know dual home solution. So it, getting um, specific for a moment around how we would recommend building um, a solution like this. You know this is the this is a, a, a physical layout or a little bit of a map layout of of Equinix in Ashburn, and you know DC2 is where we have a high concentration of network providers. Um, you see the other data centers just around it. DC11 was open this year, um, but you know a little over a mile away we have DC3, and in between those facilities we have um, large bundles of fiber that are in the ground on our campus. So there's there's really uh, no chance for it to get cut with some contractor coming in and digging up work, but you're able to link that over a fiber cross connect between both and the, 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 the response times are less than a millisecond. I mean it's just like it's sitting right next to you in your same data center even though it's down the road. So at least this level of design will provide you a foundation to build an HA solution even though it's in region. So in case something happens at one of these locations you have the other one open and available to you. So each one of these data centers is fed by um, in it's run by independent power lines coming in from the utility. They have their own generators. They have their own diverse network paths in and out. So they're made to be survivable in and amongst themselves. So this is an in-region version of the way it would look. Now, if we want to look at a, a more global or broader uh, HA solution, then taking advantage of the providers that with network carriers that we have at Equinix, you can run higher bandwidth connectivity between our major markets. So between New York and DC or between DC and Silicon Valley, uh, some of the uh, response times we get are going to be the lowest and the most direct in the industry. Again, it's not Equinix providing it. It's just because the, the carriers that do have services in our centers, it's all on net for them. It's already on their core backbone. So there's no local access loops or there's no additional tethering that they have to do to get you to their core backbone services. So you have literally some of the most direct routes between these points. So, you know, for example, going from New York to DC, typically across a range of providers, sub 12 millisecond, and you can get a, gig a gigabit ethernet circuit for less than $750 a month typically. And so if you think about that, I know from the enterprise days that certainly fits into a lot of ranges for application performance and tolerances for your know, re-replication or if you need to do backup services, that's a tolerance that's usually within the limits of a lot of the performance requirements. Going across the coast, you're looking in, you know, or in the low 50 millisecond time range. So you could have complete ge ge geographically diverse um, solutions and deployments throughout, uh, throughout the United States using platform Equinix. Thanks, Bryson, for that um, overview of the data center. We, a lot of the what we're going to talk about today now from the database and the Oracle side of it is heavily dependent on that infrastructure being in place. Um, it, it's almost a requirement. It's a, a, also a constraint if you can't meet some of these latency and connectivity issue requirements. And so we'll get into that in a minute. A little bit about Neovera, uh, a little background on us. We were founded in 2001, headquartered in Reston, Virginia. We're a provider of complex hosting solutions leveraging over a decade of uh, technical expertise in consulting, managed services, data center services, and enterprise cloud solutions. Uh, we've grown to support hundreds of diverse client systems across multiple tier four data centers. Uh, today we are a vendor agnostic hosting provider with 24 seven operations based on site at the Equinex data center in Ashburn, uh, one of the largest internet and mobile traffic exchanges in North America. A little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a certified professional. Uh, I have over 16 years experience working with the Oracle and Oracle products. I've worked in various industries, healthcare, manufacturing, government, financial, B2Bs. Uh, I've 
done, I've been a presenter at various Oracle user groups. I've also taught Oracle classes. Um, and my background is, is runs a full gamut of D, DBA operational development, data modeling, consulting, uh, and I've designed and managed a, a variety of different types of environments. Today's agenda, I'm going to talk about the use case which um, kind of instigated the design we're going to talk about today, some of the design considerations that went into the overall uh, solution, some of the traditional HADR uh, environments, what the extended rack brings to that, the infrastructure, a little bit of overview of what the solution was, and what that looked like, and the design benefits and some operational aspects that you have to be aware of when you take on an extended rack environment. So for our use case, we had a trading system. It was for a financial institution, uh, supplies market services to uh, exchange traded fund authorized participants. It was considered uh, a business critical piece of their business. Uh, it was public uh, customer facing application. Uh, the database wa access was required for physical and organizational decoupled report generation systems. So basically this system was going to be fed is it takes in data from a lot of different uh, s other systems and then reports back out to these systems. Uh, minimum uptime requirement was 99.8 from the customer. Uh, we did have a constraint in that they already had an Oracle Standard Edition license for this and, and we had to use that to uh, come up with the solution. So we didn't have the benefit of picking and choosing the Oracle products and, and things like that. We had to work within that edition. So what you're going to see today was all implemented on Oracle Standard Edition. So the centerpiece of design considerations for any extended rack, it, one is, and the most important is the data center, uh, because everything is driven by the latency between the sites, um, and also a factor in deciding how far you can get away one data center from the other is that cost of connectivity and whether that's already in place or it has to be incurred as part of the solution. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the storage network and the database side of it. One of the things they wanted was no downtime for the application whenever we did hardware maintenance, uh, database patches, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can actually go through full storage unit maintenance downtime without ever affecting the application. So a traditional rack system, you know, typically is single data center centric, so everything's in the same data center same cages typically or, or, or close proximity of each other. It is typically a single storage solution so you don't have multiple storage arrays um, sitting behind the rack traditionally. Um, they rely or you may rely on a DR site uh, if you have a site outage. So you've deployed something, a standby database or something on another site somewhere and that's generally your passive uh, DR site or what most people do. Um, so we find when as a consulting company and we go in and we actually are taking over the management, we find a lot of customers use an enterprise edition. You know, Oracle persuaded them into buying that to get the data guard. Uh, sometimes we see them not even using data guard uh, in the setup of that properly. Uh, there are, it's much more expensive than Oracle standard edition. There are other ways of doing DR without enterprise edition and without data guard. If you do have that, you you know you do have some additional DBA skill sets that are required if you're going to configure data guard properly for performance, uh, availability, or protection, depending on what your uh, recovery point and recovery time objectives are. And then you know DBAs need to know how to do switchovers um, and failovers, which a lot of DBAs that run in the data guard, it's kind of a lights out thing, um, and you know, they only learn what to do when the actual switchover failover actually has to occur. And then what additional pieces you have to monitor from that. And what we see is most people are configuring that for active passive. Um, so in that scenario, you, you do have to take into account some configuration issues for the application to be aware of a, of a failover or switchover. Um, and when it's in an active passive, generally it's a low return on your investment if you've licensed and paid for that. That's that DR site. So what we did was come up with uh, extended rack to meet the client's needs for this application. Uh, extended rack, uh, it's known by other names, uh, campus clusters, Metro Geo, or 
or stretch or extended clusters. That, so you'll hear them referred to as that. Uh, traditional, it's it's basically a traditional rack setup, except the nodes reside in different geographical locations uh, with some additional things. But it, it's not much more than what your staff or DBA or skill sets might have if they're experienced with rack already. Uh, the setup and configuration of the Oracle rack is independent of the distance. So if done correctly, the rack doesn't need to know that something is you know, across the street or five miles down the road. Uh, again, latency is the primary factor that determines how far these uh, nodes are going to be apart from each other. Uh, similar configuration when designing an Oracle rack in the same data center that has redundancy at all levels. So, you know, the switches and, and things like that, uh, private, public interconnects, uh, networking, that's all similar to a standard rack environment. Except in the extended rack, we're going to have full use of the hardware at both sites. So it's going to be full active active. Uh, we have immediate recovery from a, an entire site failure. So the entire building goes away. Um, that's generally zero to no data loss and no downtime. Uh, the most affected operations in deploying an extended rack is read. Uh, it's, uh, read intensive operations are less affected than the right ones. So uh, if it's read primarily a read application, you're probably not going to see anything by extending the rack, depending on the distance and latency. So the infrastructure behind the extended rack for us, again, we and the Equinox data center, it, it is our primary hosting location. We have a physical footprint in four of the buildings on campus, uh, and we have an on-site 24-7 uh, knock that's there physical prep pre presence, rather. The infrastructure we use for deploying the solution, uh, we're running HP uh, three-part T400s, uh, 120 drives, 8 gigabit bandwidth. Uh, the storage was laid out with ones on RAID 5, which under three-par, they do uh, the striping a little different. It's a set striping, so it's really more of a RAID 50. Um, on our networking for communication between sites, we're using uh, the Nexus 5548 switches, so they're unified for Ethernet, the fiber channel, and fiber channel over Ethernet, uh, more of a converged. And the database software we used was 11, uh, Oracle 11 GR2. It was originally 11.203 something, uh, you know, we're running currently at .7. Uh, it is standard edition with rack, and we are using the automatic storage management with uh, three disk groups, and we'll talk about the disk groups here in a second. So on the database side, uh, ASM, and again, this is not uncommon um, as far as disk group layout for rack. We have a separate disk group that handles the grid. So this is our voting disks um, and the clusterware stuff. And then we have data, and we have a recovery disk groups. Um, the difference with the extended rack is on the redundancy side. Typically in uh, Oracle rack and uh, single site installations, uh, a lot of people use uh, the ex ex external redundancy, which means the storage unit is handling all the mirroring and, the, and how does it respond to a failure of a drive. It's handled at the storage level. When you use extended rack environments, you need to switch to normal or high three-way uh, mirroring. And you need to know how that affects your disk, the amount of disk you need and the number of lunch required to support that. So for the grid, if you're going to do normal two-way mirroring, you have to have three disks or LUNs, and we'll talk about what that, those three are. Um, if you're going to use high, you need five LUNs. Uh, you need one LUN from each storage array, so you're basically going to take one layout in one storage unit in one data center and mirror that same LUN layout in that storage unit in another data center. And then you're going to have uh, this third disk that we're going to need for the grid is going to be uh, NFS from an NFS server, and that's going to serve as a quorum vote disk. And we'll talk about how, what that quorum vote disk needs to be able to do. Um, and that's really your, going to be your arbitrator between those two sites to see, make sure every, every site is up and running, each node is available, and there's no errors occurring. And for the data and FRA, 
Uh, those are normal two-way and three-way requires two disks or three disks depending on which redundancy level you pick. Uh, you want to make sure, like I said, matching the lines between each storage array. And then you also want to do some things for performance, and I'll get into more detail on each one of these, but you, you would want to set preferred disk groups, read disk groups, so that each data center talks to its own storage array as a uh, first choice. And then the database and ASM compatibility needs to be bumped up. It needs to be 11.1, I think, at minimum, but uh, we're running 11.2, so compatibility is 11.2. So if you're going to migrate to this and you didn't change the defaults, this ASM compatibility is one that you're probably going to have to change. So the full overview of the architecture that we ended up deploying here, uh, you can see we have three data centers involved. We have a node in each data center. We have redundant switches, um, and that, that's serving up fiber channel Ethernet uh, and the fiber channel over Ethernet. There are some other switches and stuff in there for some of the networking, private, uh, interconnect, and things like that, but these are the major key components. In an extended rack, it's important to try to minimize the hardware between the sites because every piece of hardware, switch, router, every hop that has to take place between the two data centers introduces the potential for latency. And your primary goal for stretching this rack is to make sure you get keep the latency as low as possible. So we actually have redundant switches on each side. Uh, we're using 3PAR on each side. And then in one of our data centers, it's just serving up as an NFS server to serve this third voting disk that's going to arbitrate between the two in the event of um, a failure. Uh, one of the things to note in the picture, and you know, we were able to uh, test and evaluate, is we had a full three-par uh, storage outage at one data center for maintenance. So it was a scheduled thing where uh, HP came in and did some major maintenance on it. That whole time it was out was unbeknownst to the user base. The application continued to run, and you know we we didn't experience any sort of data loss or anything. So we've kind of went through scenarios where we've done hardware maintenance on different aspects of this and tested, and was able to confirm that not one piece of the application you know had a hiccup or or suffered any kind of loss. Now, granted, with this in, with this setup, the entire data center could go away, and you literally should not have any data loss, and you should not have any application uh, downtime as a result. So the major benefits of using your an extended rack approach, highly available, uh, zero dime, downtime, like I said, for when we did far, firmware upgrades for the hardware, uh, zero downtime for database patches and one-off patches. Is this is more of your bugs and your uh, quarterly PSUs. Uh, obviously, if you're going to do a major release version, there's there's downtime involved with just the database setup piece of it. But to maintain the database at its level with patches is zero downtime. For disaster recovery, uh, zero downtime for an entire data center outage, uh, single site infrastructure failure. Uh, this. Extend or the extended rack in general is considered as a tier six disaster recovery plan. Uh, so that's a zero or near zero data loss. I mean, there's roughly, I think, seven tiers. And so we're you're sitting at the uh, close to the top of the tier on your disaster recovery planning. One of the things to point out, though, relative to disaster recovery, it is not uh, part of Oracle's maximum availability architecture. They, even though extended rack gives you a lot of this DR functionality, uh, Oracle's MAA says that the you should be running a true standby database, either uh, incorporated replication via data guard or through Golden Gate, um, and that's really because of one, or two things. One is human errors. Uh, so in an extended rack, if if something happened at the object level or data level. Uh, that's going to be the same on the other site as well. So, so some human errors, those particular human errors may not be recoverable. But again, with Oracle, with a lot of the new features, you can mitigate those things, but it doesn't cover every case. Um, and it doesn't meet their MAA policy because it needs to be a geo 
uh, location that can be protected from a disaster that can affect the same region. So they really want you to get out of the region to be able to do that. Now with low latency data center connectivity out of region, this would be possible, you'd still uh, be able to meet that requirement. It's just worth noting that it's not something Oracle would consider MAA. Again, on the setup of the rack, it's much of the same installation as uh, a normal rack setup. So if you already have staff that's uh, familiar with deploying rack environments, some of the same things are all going to be the same for them. You know, your public network setup is the same. Your private network is the same. You know, and again, even like, even without extended rack, I you know prefer to go to uh, jumbo frames if you can. You still have scan addresses that have to be defined. You still need to enable multicasting on the interfaces. Those kind of additional or those kind of things are all the same. Some additional considerations that may go beyond what you might do for a normal rack is your ASM, and we talked about this, the uh, redundancy level. You have to be at least normal. You need to def uh, define the failure groups within the ASM so that you can do fast resync, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And you have to have this third voting file, um, which is your core of disk. Additionally, in extended rack, what you may not have to, and most people would never touch probably on a local rack setup, is uh, buffer credit configuration. So as you extend out these, the distance between these data centers, you need to start looking at the buffer credit configuration. Um, and that it, as, as I stated here, it's greater than 10 kilometers is when you really need to probably definitely start increasing that size to reduce the latency and the throughput. So an example here, you know, 10 kilometers, your round trip is, uh, if distance is 10 kilometers, then your round trip is going to be double. If the throughput is 2 gig, then gigabits per second, then your frame length is 2K then we need 10 buffer credits to get that full bandwidth. And these are configuration changes at the OS and the module level. Um, you need to start tuning that. If you have an extended rack and you haven't touched that, chances are you could probably get um, a noticeable performance increase by increasing that. The voting disk. We talked about there needed to be multiple voting disks. Uh, Oracle Clusterware accesses a voting file every second for read and write with less than about a uh, kilobyte of data read or written. So it's, it's uh, frequent, but it's not a lot of data. Um, the acknowledgement of that write IO needs to be received in 200 seconds. Under normal operations, that's what they consider their long disk timeout and 27 seconds during a reconfiguration in the cluster. So that's the short disk right now. Uh, we'll see how these are, you, you can actually change these or how these are actually used to determine whether or not a node gets evicted. Again, everything's about that latency. Uh, typically that third voting file is on an NFS. That's cheap, it's easy. The only thing you need to make sure is connectivity between those. It doesn't introduce an enormous amount of uh, latency. That connectivity to the third location, you need to be able to have I.O. that can be acknowledged in approximately 14 seconds in average, uh, minimum throughput of at least 128K. Um, so that's kind of, that's easy to meet in most data center, uh, extended data center setups. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, you know, if you query using the cluster control command, you query your voting disk, you will see, you know, you have three of, in this example, we have uh, two of them. One, one is in one data center storage device, the other is in another data center storage device, and the third one is uh, NFS mount. That's mounted on each node uh, for the quorum disk. So some of the settings for the clusterware that you have to be aware of. Uh, there's two heartbeat mechanisms that are used for extended rack, um, it, or becomes predominant in extended rack, and that's the miscount, miscount and the disk timeout. Uh, so the miscount value represents the amount of time in seconds that that heartbeat can be missed before it starts to consider that node to be evicted. Uh, you can get your current miscount using cluster control command. The default is 30. Most of the time you're not going to have to change that. Uh, different, you, there are cases with different adapters and different storage units that you may want to look at this, but generally 30 seconds is the default. And, and you have to be careful when you mess with this number as well. 
it, this number is used in calculating other numbers. So the lower you make this, the lower you might end up making other things that could introduce evictions that you didn't have before. So you have to be careful with messing with that. This is 11.2, by the way. The, the value was different in previous versions, and you know they recommended changing the default to another value, but this is the recommended value now, 11.2. The disk timeout is the heartbeat to the voting disk, so it has uh, an internal I.O. timeout, which is their short disk timeout in seconds, uh, and it, that's when that I.O. actually has to complete. Uh, it's directly related to the miscount setting, so this is why I say if you edit one, you need to be careful how it changes something else. So the short disk timeout on this is your uh, miscount minus uh, reboot time, which in Oracle they list it as three seconds. So you, you, in this case, you do uh, cluster control. You can see the disk timeout, which is uh, default, is 200. We didn't have a, a need to change that, so that, that remained the same at 11.2. Additional settings for the cluster where, if you stretch this out to its limits and you start introducing latency, and you would, at that point, you would start uh, experiencing node evictions. There are some things to look at in the actual uh, infrastructure to make sure that that particular latency or those settings for the miscount this time out are covered under other uh, values. Which are, example, HBA cards, uh, then the default miscount. Uh, so these are settings that you want to look at, at settings on your existing infrastructure, whether it be the cards, the SAN storage array, the, the switches, um, you know, power path devices, things like that. You want to make sure that you're not setting parameters at that level that then negate the miscount, the disk time, uh, disk I/O timeouts, um, causing more node evictions than you should. So when would a node evict? And now this is the case whether you are regular rack or extended. It becomes more prevalent and extended, obviously, because of the latency. So network ping, if it completes within that number of miscount second, seconds, and the disk ping com completes within that miscount seconds, you're not going to get a reboot. This is, is normal operation. This is normal uh, Oracle monitoring that keeps those nodes in, in existence. Under other cases where you, uh, the network ping might stay within the miscount seconds, but the disk timeout seconds is now exceeding what the setting was, you would get a reboot or a node eviction. And the same way if you had both network and disk. So there's cases here where those values are looked at and the formula for deciding whether or not a node gets evicted. These are all, again, all things that latency uh, could introduce. On the ASM side, there's different ways in the extended rack to do the disk mirroring. I mean, you could do host-based or ray-based or whatever. Um, the recommended is use ASM, let ASM mirror these devices across. Uh, there's some benefits to using ASM for uh, bringing that disk back online in the event of a failure or an outage. Uh, so in our case, we used ASM. You do need to modify uh, your disk repair time attributes on your disks. So the default out of the box ASM rack installation, you're going to get 3.6 hours. If you have scheduled maintenance on a storage array and that's going to be scheduled for four hours, you've missed the disk repair timeout for ASM. ASM is then going to take that disk offline. So you need to be cognizant of what your maintenance windows are and what your expected repair times are. This is something that can be changed on the fly. So if you know it's going to be out for eight versus normal three or four hours, then obviously you would want to change that in advance. Um, so this is the maximum tolerance for that outage of a disk before it actually becomes dropped. So when you take a storage unit out, it goes offline immediately. At that point, the timer starts, and it starts to count down for 3.6 hours. Um, once that timer reaches zero, the disk is dropped. Okay, so that's what you want to try to avoid because now to bring it back, you're going to have to resync that entire drive. That's what we want to try to avoid. Um, so additionally, 
what if you're not monitoring it today, and surprisingly enough, there are a lot of DBA shops and rack environments that we look at where nobody ever looks at the repair timer. Uh, you should be looking at that even in a normal rack environment. You want to know if discs go offline and start going into a repair mode, uh, or at least constrained by that timer. The additional thing we talked about is when you have distributed environments, you don't want data nodes in one data center accessing data in the other storage array in the other data center if the data is there locally. You, you want to set a preferred path to your nodes in the data center to the storage in the data center. And that's done with the ASM preferred read fail groups. This will not be set for you, so if you did an out-of-the-box installation, extended rack, you wouldn't get this. Um, and you could get that cross data center type read activity. So what you want to do is set the disk groups specific to each node in the data center to its local storage array. Uh, requires the compatibility be set to 11.2 to do this. Uh, so that's something you, that out of the box, uh, that compatibility might be too low and you need to change that. Here's a query you could use to verify that compatibility. Uh, so this shows the actual compatibility and ASMN database compatibility. In our case, three disk groups, all of them set to 11.2. Example of monitoring that repair timer that I talked about. Um, so if you look at the group, in this case, three groups, um, you can see the uh, state of each disk group the actual path to it, and in this case, everything's up and run and there's no outage, so the repair timer is zero. If one, uh, and you can see, let's if we look at this data, the two paths there, you have data 01A, uh, partition one, and B, partition one. So that's two different data centers, data center A, data center B, so to speak. Uh, those, if one of those storage units went offline, you would see that data, data A, the flash A, the grid A, repair timer automatically start kick in at the repair timer value, 3.6 hours if you left it at the default, and that would start counting down every second until it reached um, zero. So you kind of want to know if that repair timer starts, obviously. One of the additional features for the ASM um, and in the extended rack environment, why it becomes um, important in the event that you're doing scheduled maintenance is the, is the newest 11.2 feature is that fast mirror resync. So in this case, ASM keeps track of those exchanged or those changed extents that need to be applied while the disk was offline. Once the disk becomes available, then Oracle says, okay, let's just apply all the changed extents. I don't need to resync the entire disk, which prior to, you know, even 11, prior to that, you didn't have an option of fast mirror resync. It was the whole disk. Uh, obviously, if you have large LUNs defined, that could take some time. Now it's just the changes during the outage that need to be applied to bring it current. So in this case, you can see three disks and the extents on them. A disk goes away. Oracle starts making the changes on another disk for those extents. And when that disk comes back online, those extents then are replicated and mirrored back over to the disk that came on that was offline. Um, so only the changes have to occur. Could be significant in time of how fast you can get those disks back online. We talked about setting that preferred uh, read failure groups. It's just an alter system set command. Uh, you list out every one of your disk groups that are in that site. Um, and then, as you can see in this example, running a query, if we look at the disk group, if you look at the uh, fail instance one fail group data 000 and look at its reads and look at data 001, which is the second data center. See how low the reads are there. So this was on site at, you know, the first site looking at statistics and you can see everything is heavily weighted to the reads and writes, or at least the reads, I should say, not the writes, the reads at that data center site. If we were to go over to the other site and run the same query, we would see the predominant reads being local to those disks instead. So this is, you know, a great indication of how the reads are really truly being directed to the closest storage unit rather than cross cross site.
So as part of that, you, and again, we talked about that I, that latency and at the I/O level as well. How do we monitor some of that ASM performance? Uh, it's similar to the same. It is the same way that you should do it or can do it in your existing rack environments. You use the ASM command utility. Um, it does get the same information out of the ASM disk I/O stat view. So if you've written SQL statements, you're going to get the same output, uh, same values. But you can do it with ASM. Uh, you can run it from the command line and, and write those out, save it out, or, or whatever you want to do with it if you want to script it. But basically, you can list out all the errors that might, might occur, list the statistics for a specific disk group only, suppress the headers if you're going to spool this to a file and use it for something else, uh, I, display I.O. instead of bytes, time statistics for reading and writing. Uh, if you've set up regions on your ASM disk groups for hot and cold, uh, reads and writes, that information will, will be displayed, and then you can specify an interval. So if we look at, I just ran it for just one second, um, you can see in this one second time, uh, this particular data, 000, had 50 reads, one write, read time, and write times. Um, so you can, this is the same information that you would get from that V dollar sign view as well. So it's something that you should be looking at uh, because if you start to experience latency, you need to know if, if the disk side of it is being affected. Some additional tuning that we've found um, that helps with the latency, and again, this really applies to uh, local versus ex and extended racks, but again, your goal for extended racks is to cut out and minimize every bit of latency in the system as you can which then allows you to stretch the cluster further and further. Um, and some of these that are most common that we end up on tuning and tweaking and we see hasn't been changed or definitely needs to be changed is uh, some of the I.O. parameters for the adapter. We're trying to make changes. And again, these are kind of post-installation because you need to uh, incur some statistics to be able to make some intelligent decisions on the changes. Uh, to minimize the I.O. request on the queue, Minimize the time spent uh, waiting to be moved to LUN queue, which is your A wait time, and you maximize your I.O. service time. So we're looking at that average queue size, that A wait time, and that service time. And we're looking at uh, what are the changes that, can, that we can make at the adapter level to, to help that out. You, another big one that we see that no one really ever changes, um, and, and there are cases where these make significant improvements in performance is uh, tuning the read ahead for the devices. So if you, uh, and that command is a block dev command, uh, we will issue against those particular devices changing, setting the actual read ahead. Uh, what we do is we actually check the default, we baseline the default, and then we test with different values. You can, those range up to like 32 meg, I think, on uh, Linux. So you have to test the different values because different disks for used for different um, reasons, example, data versus FRA, have different numbers that work best. So it's not always increase the number and that gave you a, a 30 or 40% increase in performance. And that same number can then be used for every disk group. That's not the way it works. Um, and you really, and it's heavily dependent on the devices. So what we do is you can run an HD ARM minus T um, on the, that device name with different settings and see the actual results of how that number affects uh, the actual throughput and the service times and things like that. So these are, these are two of the biggest categories of tuning that we see at the device and, and uh, OS level that could help reduce some of that latency. And additionally, you know, we've looked, everybody's starting to uh, look at Oracle 12C now and what capabilities it might be and how we might take advantage of some of those things in your environments for an upgrade or to justify upgrade. One of the things as part of the, the upgrade planning we're doing for this uh, extended rack environment is to, you know, look at what features of that that the client can benefit from by upgrading. Um, one of the things is now with Oracle 12C, you can now support multiple subnets for the scan addresses. Uh, so you couldn't do that before. Uh, you could do that for some of the other uh, 
networking components, but you couldn't do it for the scan address. Now you can actually have scan listeners sitting on different subnets. Um, so if you're going in different data centers and you have some different net network topology outside of the database, uh, you might be able to, that this might be something that would be beneficial for you. Uh, there is also some new things in for the fast mirror resync. Uh, you now control the power limit. Uh, so even when even though it's only syncing the changes, you have control over the parallelism uh, for performance on that. So it's much faster um, from an instance failure by being able to resync that. And if you had to stop it or if it failed, you can actually resume it at another point. So you didn't have that resumability before 12C as well. And also, it, it actually gives you a time estimate for the completion of the resync. Um, at best, you were guessing at that sometimes before um, on how much or how long that resync would take based on the number of changed extents. Now it gives you a uh, in the actual operation that's being performed, it gives you a, a time estimate. Additionally, in 12C, uh, you have disk scrubbing checks that can be done now. So you can actually do an alter disk group scrub command and uh, check for logical corruptions and repairs. So these are all things, and, and then again, this is automatic in your normal and high redundancy disk groups, which you would have as part of your extended rack anyway. Uh, but these are all just features that allows you to verify and check things uh, to allow that, that extra site to be available as much as possible. Um, and you also have a replace disk command. So it's kind of a mix of your rebalance and your fast mirror functionality. Um, you can have a, a replacement disk populated with all the data from the surviving disk. Um, so this now reduces the amount of time it takes for you to replace a failed disk if that disk goes out. And so that pretty much concludes what an extended rack solution might look like, some of the key factors that you might need to consider, um, and you know what you might want to look at, or some of the decision-making steps that go into deciding how far you might get an extended rack. And will it actually meet your DR uh, requirements and fulfill your HA at the same time, uh, you know, lessen your cost ultimately? So, if there's any other questions, we'd like to open it up and feel free to ask myself or if you have any data center specific questions as well, um, address those to Bryson. We'd be happy to answer those. I think uh, you click on the hand raised icon. Con, uh, type your question, we'll be able to retrieve those. Tom, go ahead. Tom, You have a question, Tom? How far is the distance? Our distance in this particular client setup was across the two data centers, of a little over a mile. Um, there are a lot of clients, this is the, the extended rack is very popular for some reason in, uh, overseas in the UK. There's lots of test cases and existing clients that are using it. Um, it's very predominant over there and they've stretched them 10 and 20 kilometers without any issue. Um, so across the street, uh, within the same campus region, those are easily doable. The, the backbone it really becomes predominant when you start stretching 10 kilometers or more. You, you have to start factoring as a general rule of thumb of at least a millisecond latency for every 50 miles or so you go. So you can you can see that there is a limit at which point the latency exceeds uh, for the distance. Most people are not deploying over 100 kilometers, and there's tons of uh, HP, Oracle, and other vendors with Oracle doing extended rack testing uh, as far as distance versus latency. 
and those range anywhere from 20 to 80 kilometers uh, within to stay within tolerances. There's no other questions. I want to thank you guys for attending the presentation. We will have these slides available uh, for those that are interested, and you'll also be able to pull down this uh, presentation from our YouTube channel. Uh, you don't have to remember this link, but you can go to YouTube and search for Near Vera and pull that up. Uh, if you have any questions for data center, uh, functionality, capability, characteristics, be sure to reach out to Bryson. He can answer those. If you have any questions from a database perspective, uh, on the Oracle side, as far as the presentation or extended rack um, environment considerations, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be glad to answer your questions as well. Uh, Actually, we have a question. Oh, we have another question. Um, in extended rack, how is data replicated from one center to another using ASM units? So those. In this is all handled the same way it would be if you had even a local rack. Um, but ASM is actually mirroring those blocks between ASM instances. So between the uh, interconnect, that information is going between one ASM instance to the other ASM instance at those particular extents. So ASM is shipping that information. There's no extra third-party application or no Golden Gate, none of that kind of stuff is involved. It's strictly ASM to ASM disk mirroring. And that's, it's the same technology you would use if you did a single instance database on ASM and set up redundancy on normal. So Oracle is going to manage the replication, the, the, the syncing of the blocks and extents between the ASM disks itself. So the technology is all within Oracle ASM. You just have to ensure that the latency stays low enough not to cause it to evict. And we and we do as you know every quarter we apply the quarterly PSUs. As soon as they come out, we start planning for all our clients to to start that uh, process. And we've never had the application aware of the fact that we've applied PSUs uh, in this extended rack environment. We've actually been able to apply all those PSUs. We've actually taken down switches and storage, uh, and the applications never went down at all. So it is um, single node rack on both sides? It does not have to be single node rack on both sides. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that we had a constraint of Oracle Standard Edition. And as part of that, you only allowed four sockets. Um, and in our case, it was one node on each side because each node had two sockets. Uh, each node was a two socket, eight core machine. Uh, so within standard edition, the total of those sockets was four, so we couldn't exceed that. It's, it, there's no limit to the number of nodes on each side. Uh, you're only constrained by your, you know, I guess for standard edition, max on each side would be four, uh, one CPU machines. No other questions? So I'd like to thank you guys for attending the presentation. Again, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions on Oracle or uh, the data center or any of the services Neovera provides around Oracle. Uh, and we'd be glad to help you. Thank you.